Okay, I'm joined today at the Royal Aeronautical Society by Tim Clark, President of, uh, President of Emirates Airline and Fellow of the Royal Aeronautical Society. Tim, welcome to Hampton Place and thank you for sparing up the time to speak to us. Good to be here. So what's your take on the, the current outlook for air, like airlines today? Uh, fuel prices are still high but have stabilised. Is this light at the end of the tunnel? Well, if fuel prices come off a little bit further, and there is evidence that that is starting to happen for a variety of reasons, but if we can get the fuel costs into um, some kind of uh, ratio that allows us to become profitable again, uh, then uh, you know, that would be a great thing for the industry. So where are we today? Uh, Emirates has 41% of its total cost, which is fuel. Uh, that's an element of our costs which are very difficult to, con to control. Um, and therefore we have to live with that and everything that we do whether it be development and interaction new products where we fly to how often all the bits and pieces that go about managing and running airlines is is predicated about uh, by the, the fuel price so relief on that yes there is evidence that is coming off yes in the long term you're seeing new hydrocarbons coming to market the shale oil gas which is going to be transformational in the global economy, not the least of which it's likely that America will be self-sufficient by 2020, 2025 in, in, in its own oil requirements. What will that do for fuel prices? Should bring them down with a bit of luck. Um, and then hopefully we can get the industry back into, in, into profit, although Emirates, I'm pleased to say, has been profitable and we've just cleared another year of good profit. So, but it's difficult for everybody. Talking of profit, you, you, you have recorded, recorded a four-year profit for the past financial year of 52%, which is pretty impressive. Are those kind of profits sustainable, do you think, going forward? Um, well, kind of my job depends on that. <laughs> I, well, Emirates is, is a, an airline that is required to be totally self-sufficient. Um, we must do everything according to our own grand design. The government, although it be the owner, doesn't help us in any shape or form. Uh, you know, where we're accused of getting cheap oil, well, Dubai hasn't got any oil, um, and cheap money, well, they don't have a lot of that. So we really have to, to develop what we're doing and, and maintain a strong balance sheet, uh, pin lots of cash to it if we're, we're smart, and grow the business profitably. We've managed to do that. Um, we've done it now for 27 of our 28 years, um, and I believe that we are strong enough to continue to do that. I, I remain confident that we talked about fuel earlier, we talked about green shoots in the green shoots in the global economy. So taken together, I, I'm forever the optimist anyway, so it takes a lot to knock us down and push us down and make us give up. So yes, I think the prognosis for future profitability remains as good as it has been. Okay. But do you have any concerns about the operating environment going forward? Uh, you know, the year-ending uh, sort of profit margin fell from 9.9 .9 in March 2011 to 3.1 in mm -hmm. 2013. Is, is that the new norm going forward? No, it doesn't have to be. A lot of that is, as we said earlier, fuel. Yeah. If you fuel should be in the region of 70 to 80 dollars. Whatever people may tell you about global demand in Asia and China and this and that, I'm sorry, but that is where fuel sits. And that's where airlines can get themselves back on their feet and make money. And the net margins that we will create will be much better when we get that off. In the last few years, and in fact the last few decades, the airline industry has led in, 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 as, as a model to other industries as to how to go about reducing unit costs in the, in the long term and, and really producing a highly efficient business. Otherwise they wouldn't have survived and some, as we know, have, have failed. So it's a good business, it's a strong business underlying it's a strong business. Give us a chance, give us a break and we'll be all right. <laughs> now, uh, until mm. recently, the, the golf carriers, including yourselves, have stayed away from alliances and partnerships. Mm -hmm. uh, now we see we have Emirates and Qantas, uh, mm. Etihad taking a stake in Jet Airways, Qatar joining One World. Um, what's going on here? What, what's the rationale behind it now? Well, I, I, I have on many occasions, I think the last public announcement was in, uh, I made in, uh, I after in Beijing last year, June, where I said, listen, what is happening, it's not about the Gulf carriers, it's about the realignment of business models, and in those I include the alliance players, to adjust and align what they're doing with the way the global economy has shifted significantly since the mid-90s, to reflect the growing demand for air travel, 
which takes different forms in terms of the traffic patterns that we're now seeing emerging countries to emerging countries, emerging countries to developed countries, developed countries to um, areas that perhaps were considered to be, and I, I, I would describe that by way of an example, the African continent, where there was a massive pullback in the 70s and 80s. Um, but here we have new markets emerging. So what you're seeing is the um, recognition, one, the Gulf carriers are not going to go away, to the size and scale of what they're doing on a, on a global scale has to be reckoned with. It's no point continuing to throw bricks or try and take us down because you've been doing that for years and it hasn't got you anywhere. In fact, if you look back at when you started and what we were then and what we are now, hey ho, there's, there's absolutely there's no there's no um, point to it. But why have we been successful? Why have we been able to grow a business? Because we have aligned what we do with the way the new world order is functioning. They must do the same to survive. Alliances and the current structure of them, in my view, my humble opinion, do not reflect what the 21st century requires of the industry. They do reflect what the airline industry required of them in the 70s and the 80s. But, you know, that was light years ago. So basically, what we are doing with Qantas and what perhaps James Hogan has been doing with his clustering of other carriers and, and Akbar, of course, going into um, One World, it suggests that there is there is change, but we're not changing our policies of aligning with, with what I would consider perhaps unfairly Jurassic blocks. I want to be able to chart our own destiny, go where we're, and if we can find like-minded thinkers who see benefit, mutual benefit, this is what is, these are partnerships, these aren't a, a multifaceted complex alliance, these are simple partnerships. We've had one with Sri Lanka many years ago. We've had multiple arrangements with carriers. Qantas is probably the biggest one, hopefully it'll be the most successful one. Okay. You've, you've <coughs> obviously got some uh, fairly powerful and ambitious competitors in the region from mm -hmm. the form of Qatar and Etihad. Is there room enough for everybody in, in, in there? $64,000 question and something that gets asked regularly. <laughs> so far so good. I was asked that in the mid late 90s when Qatar formed. I was asked that in 2004 when Etihad formed. Well if you look at our figures we grow 20% per annum and our passenger figures continue to grow. We layer on the capacity, we open the routes as Akbar does and as James Hogan does. So the answer to the question is evidential is yes, there is room because we're doing uh, the same kind of thing but we are global in our market reach, global in our thinking. So when you look at the global as, as the global market, as your market, not a domestic market, then yes, there's plenty of scope. Okay. Um, you're obviously the, the largest operator of ever say for the 80s, with mm -hmm. 90 on order and, and 10 delivered over the past just in the past year, mm -hmm. uh, phenomenal amount of, of capacity. How did the recent wind crack issue affect your operations and, and services? Uh, and obviously now it's, it's solved. Will you be ordering more A380s in the future? Uh, in answer to the first question, in the in the initial uh, period where we were faced with this, we were pretty devastated because it had ramifications throughout the whole of our operation. Uh, when we sat down with Airbus and we worked our way in real detail to get through this, them of course doing the fix uh, analysis and everything else, and, and now we have a, an agreed program where 34 of our aircraft have to go into uh, six week uh, periods in various uh, maintenance re repair organizations across the world at Airbus expense I might add. So we now have mapped that in. So we planned that in the summer of last year to start now. Our first aircraft went in for this fix about four or five days ago. And between now and November 14, and uh, we will see all of them go through. But we've been able to adjust the schedules, our programs, to take four to six aircraft out at any one point in time. Yes, that's painful. Yes, it's retarded what we would have liked to do. And yes, it's been particularly significant with this aeroplane because it is the most popular aircraft on the Emirates fleet. And will you be wanting more in the future then? And in the future, if we could, we would have ordered many more some years ago. But we have physical constraints at the Dubai Hub, even though that's growing, uh, I mean it grew 18% April last year, this year over April last year. Um, and so we're all fighting each other to get the, the slots. I've got Fly Dubai that was created by the Dubai government, now run as a separate entity a bit like we are. They're fighting for slots and they're fighting us. <laughs> but, it's, uh, but it's a high class problem. So now you see the airport probably going to reach 90 to 100 million by 2017 at this rate of growth. Okay. Um, you're also obviously a valued uh, customer to Boeing uh, mm -hmm. and you've been quite vocal in defining its latest upgrade mm -hmm. uh, to the 777, the 777X. 
Will you be play, placing a launch order at Paris in June? And, and how many aircraft Look, might you we, be thinking of? We will place the launch order. We will place an order. I'm not sure it would be the launch order. Uh, it's likely, because we've been working with them for over two years now, two and a half years, in trying to get this specification defined and the aircraft um, got into some kind of state that would suit us. So at the moment, as we speak, we are now engaged with Boeing on detailed specification work, performance assessments, economic assessments, to make absolutely sure that we have the right aeroplane. I, I'm 95% convinced we have the right aeroplane, um, and Boeing have often said they designed it for us because we are the biggest ER operator. We will have 175 of those, and all of those will have to be replaced. So it's a slam dunk with regard to when those come up for retirement after 12, 12 years, uh, they start going out, and we would have liked to have the new aeroplane in by then. So. The, the, the announcement, the order will be placed by my boss. Um, he will have to get the approval from his boss, who's the ruler of Dubai. So what we would, and generally, if we are um, convincing enough and, and we have a compelling business case, and there is one for this, that they will probably say, yeah, that's okay with us, and you'll see a large order. Okay. Um, with your incredible rate, rate of growth that you, you, you're experiencing, what are the biggest challenging, uh, challenges that, that face you? Is it, is it finding pilots and crews? Is it maintaining the high levels of customer service? Or is it dealing with constraints and opening up new markets they might want to get to? Or securing landing rights? I'm, I'm thinking perhaps here about Canada or India. Well, I, I guess the single largest inhibitor physically is the Dubai hub. What are we going to do when we reach the critical mass, when we're, well it's not critical mass, when we reach the, the absolute constraint of the airfield? Uh, and that is a vexing question and we, uh, all the great minds in Dubai are on it because it's coming down the, the track at a very, very high speed, such as the success of the city-state, such as the, the success of aviation. So we have to deal with that. Secondly, we have some air, tra uh, air, air traffic management issues, uh, airspace issues that are also causing us concern because we, we have compression, Abu Dhabi has compression, Oman has compression, so we're trying to sort the airspace issues out and they are a real inhibitor at the moment. Um, landing rights you mentioned, yes, aeropolitics is becoming progressively more difficult. Gone are the days in 25 years ago when I used to trot around the world opening up doing bilateral agreements, knowing what we were planning to do, but then thinking that we were going to be no threat. Now they don't look at us quite like that, and they're perhaps not as generous, and in fact many of them are, are fairly um, concerned about our activities, wrongly so in my view. But, um, you know, particularly in the world of multilateralism, liberalisation in the last uh, 10 or 15 years, the way governments have been opening up, uh, yet aviation remains one of those little sticklers that they find difficulty in being as liberal as they would do, for instance, in telecommunications or utility and power or even marine. When it comes to aviation, even though they're all privatised, theoretically, <laughs> there is this legacy thinking which goes back to flying the flag of Imperial Airways as far as the UK is concerned circa 1936. So you get a little bit of that and there is a certain amount of retreat into this kind of aeropolitical fortress mentality uh, when the likes of Emirates knocks on the doors of certain countries. Uh, we try and persuade them of course that we add value to their thing um, but there are entrenched views and multiple stakeholders who don't necessarily agree with us. So is that an, an inhibitor? A little bit, but I am fairly philosophical about what we do and how we do it, driven by the belief that if there are obstacles, no problem um, cannot be dealt with. Every problem has a solution. You go around it, under it, over it, through it. And that's how you get on with the job. And if you can't win in any of those, you go somewhere else. There's plenty to do. There's plenty of countries that would love to have our presence in their markets because they value what we do and the effect that they do. So, aeropolitics, yes, manageable. We are an extremely uh, well-spread carrier by, by any stretch of the imagination on the global, on the global stage. Um, we are a, a brand and force and to be reckoned with both in terms of product, whatever, and that encompasses a multitude of uh, sins. Um, and I believe the, uh, you know, when you get the European aerospace or the American aerospace industries, which recognize us as being incredibly, incredibly potent, when you look at 44 to 50% of all the long haul 
orders for both Toulouse and for Boeing are in the hands of the three carriers in the Middle East. That's formidable because the, the supply chain that are into that um, are huge. And of course, you mentioned the 777, 8x, 9x. I guarantee you the Gata will come right beside us and order. Qantas will come right beside us and order. So taken together, and I'm sure James Hogan will also want to do the same thing because he will recognize a good yeah. aeroplane when he sees it. So or taken together, this is perhaps for So once again, it is to the Gulf carriers that they go to kick these things off. They did it with the 350, they did it with the 380, they did it with the 34500, they did it with the 33200, and they did it with the 777. So the manufacturers and the aerospace industry, despite the pressures that they receive from all around them, pol political, economic, whatever, they recognize the value. So I'm hoping that when you talk about obstacles to growth and inhibitors in the future, that these kind of people will, will, will entities will recognize just where their strengths are, where their, where their real friends are, and where the people who have found the means to buy their products and sustained that purchasing power. We haven't gone away from orders when the going's got tough. We haven't canceled. We haven't pushed back. We could have done, but we haven't. We've just, as I said, no obstacle, no problem, will get in our way. Excellent. Uh, and you mentioned the, the, uh, the, the, the kind of uh, squeeze at Dubai hub. Um, so but you're going to have this new mega hub at Dubai and World Central. It's going to be... That's part of the vexing nature of the... Of the is it going fast it. enough? Is the construction... It's, well, you see, if you'd asked me in 2009-10, we thought we might have a bit of a white elephant on our hands because the world was imploding. Dubai has taken off big time now in the last couple of years, well, 18 months. It has just gone back to the old days. And now the pressure is on the government to rekindle the uh, Maktoum uh, International Airport, which, remember, was 140 million, um, and it would, would sit the, uh, would seat us as the anchor tenant in there. Um, so, you know, it's one of those things that, in my humble opinion, it's got more chance of working than the Estuary Project does <laughs> in London. <laughs> And that, that moves on to my next question. Mm. Uh, you, you've in the past uh, suggested uh, steeper approach paths mm -hmm. uh, to, to get into uh, London Heathrow to boost mm. additional A380 services. Mm. Do you think this would solve the capacity crunch here? No, or, no. Or? I, I, what I said was, look, you, 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 to build a runway, unfortunately in this country is 10 years, to, if you really recognise that you have a capacity problem at Heathrow, you don't have it at Stansted, you don't have it at Birmingham, you don't have it at Manchester, actually. You've only got it at Heathrow. And you cannot use old traffic distribution rules which says, well, OK, look at what Birmingham's got, look, well, just tell them to go there. They won't. However hard you try to make a horse, take a horse to water, they will not go. They'll go to Schiphol, they'll go to Paris, they'll go to Frankfurt. And if you talk to an airline CEO in some of the Asian countries, and you say, go to Birmingham, they say, I don't want to go to Alabama, I want to go to the United Kingdom. And I say, let's start again. I'm not being disingenuous to them, but the fact is that there are cities in the UK that nobody's ever heard of in Chengdu, or Shanghai, or whatever. It is London that everybody knows. It is a truly global city. It transcends the United Kingdom and Europe, and it sits out there as a pulsating beacon of opportunity, liberalism, friendship, and I can go on with all the great adjectives that you can use. The fact remains, whether you like it or not, this is what it's all about. So how do you deal with that? Well, Heathrow has to be dealt with in the short term, and this is where things like the steep angle approach um, with the modern jet needs to be taken a little bit more seriously. Can we do it? I believe so. Will the multi-stakeholders that, I mean, I've been banging this drum for four or five years now. With regret, other governments, the Labour government, they started to, it started to get a bit of traction. It's starting to get a bit of traction here now. Um, I was talking to the Transport Minister, uh, Secretary of State for Transport yesterday, and uh, it, was, um, it was being, um, uh, beginning to be talked about a little bit more seriously. So we have work to do. We've already got it with City and the 319 of BA. So when Willie wanted to go to the, come in from the US, this is the way he had to do it. Does that mean aerodynamically the current aircraft, large fleet can't do it? Yes, they can. We've tried it on the simulators, um, pranged it a few times, but then got the technique right, and so we could come in at six degrees, high, stay long, land long, don't use a reverse thrust because you're light. I'm not saying you can do it in all situations, you're wet and you've got ice, etc. So that is possible. The other thing you need to do, you need to up-gauge your, your unit size. You've still got F-50s flying into Heathrow, occupying pressure slots. 
you've got to make the aircraft bigger. Um, so, and if you remember back in the 90s, it was BA that was waxing lyrical about the 380. They had double-decker buses parked under the wings and said, this is the future. The 777-300, the 777-200 then, and the 380 was the future. And I remember one of them, whether it was Colin Marshall, saying, we'll never have anything smaller than that. So then the thinking was going on. As, uh, but what's happened now? Your national carrier, British Airways, has bailed out and gone to Spain. And why would he do that? If Willie had unconstrained growth at Heathrow with two or three or two extra runways, then you wouldn't be having this debate about taking on the unions in, in Madrid and Iberia and Welling and all this kind of thing. This is all about what Heathrow could do. If you have steep angle approaches, circling back to that, you can then relax the curfew. Don't forget, curfew and footprint, decibel footprints were defined in the days of the VC-10, Trident, 111s, 707s, and bless it, the Concorde. So when the Concorde took off, you could feel the vibrations in central London. Now with the 87, the 350, the 777X, 8X, you have a completely different animal altogether. These are high bass pi bypass ratio uh, fans. The noise suppression is unbelievable. You can be on the approach um, as far west as say Q or even closer in if you want Hounslow, you won't hear the 380 land because it's so quiet. Now we have to recognize that things have changed and that there's been enormous technological advances in propulsion and in aerodynamics, because a lot of the aerodynamic noise comes through flaps and gear hanging out and all that kind of thing. But that has been mitigated. So what I'm saying, what I'm saying to the government here, listen. I mean, physically listen. Take your measurements out there with the new generation of jet. And those airlines that have invested in those should be allowed to enter the curfew, that hallowed ground the heresy of mentioning that, I'm surprised I still have my kneecaps, quite honestly, but the fact of the matter is, it could be done. Yeah. And departure with these, again with these fans, can be managed. And I think I was at a talk here where I gave and said the notion that you would keep the aircraft on the runway for longer, so you're passing through V1, rotate and V2 speeds, and keeping her on the runway, and then, when of course the aircraft is fighting to get off the ground, simple laws of aerodynamics, you keep it up and then she goes up very quickly and th therefore your the noise footprint uh, reduces significantly these are all things that can be done they need to be tested they cannot be done overnight so if you up gauge if you use mixed mode if you use uh, angle approaches you might get keep the wolf from the door for another few more years but hey ho those lines are going to cross sooner rather than later Excellent. Um, you mentioned about the, 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 the huge backlog you've got and, and, and that you and the rest of the Gulf carriers are, are and there's an interesting stats that somebody, somebody was on Twitter earlier about uh, uh, your order book exceeds the entire value of the US airline industry apparently. Well I um, never thought that was difficult. <laughs> you've got 200 aircraft in service at the moment, mm, uh, take us flip through the fleet expansion plans for the next decade, you know by 2023 how many more aircraft would you expect? Well we, we obviously we have a major Six. retirement program going on at the moment so we're getting rid of the older aircraft, about 70 of those are, are currently in the process of being um, taken out of the fleet. Uh, we will have 175 ERs, we will have 90 um, 380s and a clutch of 350s. We didn't order the 787 because at the time it was too small. Um, and we still think it's too small. Uh, and Alan Mullally, who was then CEO of uh, Boeing, and we used to have great ding-dongs with him, saying, make it bigger, Alan, make it bigger, then we'll talk to you about it. Anyway, it didn't happen. So we bought, we contracted for the 350, of which we have 70 of those and a number of options. And so if you t do the maths on all of that, you're kind of getting to the, 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 the kind of levels that we're talking about. Um, we didn't order these to be delivered overnight. So if you look at the 175 ERs, there'll be, the, the delivery stream will come into us by, finish about 2022, 23. In the process, the older ERs, which came in 205, given the 12 year rule, will start to be retired out yeah. and phased out. Um, equally, the 380s, the first 380 that was delivered to us in uh, July 2008 will be retired on, in July 2020 and a new one will, will replace it. So as far as Airbus is concerned, they can see a continuum of orders coming from Emirates for 380s simply on retirement. But if you then add the incremental units that if we could, we would buy, um, then it's, a, it's another ballpark altogether. And of course, we've always asked them to make the thing a bit bigger. 
Um, but there doesn't seem to be too much interest in that at the moment. But anyway, we'll see. Okay. Um, a big back of battleground for uh, airlines is obviously in the cabin and the uh, the IFE systems. What is Emirates doing to keep pace with consumer developments, and what, what can passengers look for in terms of, terms well, of connectivity and, and kind of? I, I like to think that we lead on this. We we were the first to have seatbacks in in seatback TVs in all classes back in 1992. Um, we have led and innovated and driven the way video on demand has come in to the market. We have we've driven our incumbent supplier Panasonic um, to produce high definition large screens, particularly in economy, and now have 12, 13 inch digital wide, 1400 channels. Um, just about everything that you can see and would like to see is on our on our uh, systems. Um, we have introduced Wi-Fi, we have internet, we have live TV, although that's proving a little bit problematical at the moment. Um, w our connectivity, particularly the internet co uh, connectivity and voice communication using your own mobile phones, we have driven. The industry went away from mobile phones, if you remember, and we would not give up on that. I personally could not understand why you could not use your own mobile phone on the airplane, that you had to use our in-arm hardwired thing. So now we're through that. You can use your own mobile phone on our airplanes. Um, the internet, of course, is hugely powerful and potent for us because as long as we can get the bandwidth in there, um, we will continue to develop that and make it fully offerable at a very cheap price, seven dollars for any number of hours, and the, you know you don't you can't use as much as we can give you. Um, what are we doing in the future? Um, there is quite a lot more coming. Uh, screen sizes will change yet again, particularly in the premium cabins. Um, the um, as I said, the 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 continuing development of down the connectivity path so we want to feel and as one of our uh, mantras has been alignment with not just consumer electronics going along around us and that's particularly important because it has been revolutionary and the speed at which that has come to market continues to stagger us but we've had to say we cannot remain where we are and rest on our laurels because within 10 minutes it's all changed mm. iPhone 25 iPhone 503 Samsung this and Samsung we lose track yeah. um, and yeah I still go around with my Nokia 6310 iPhone um, which is sitting on the table over there which uh, which does the job for me however the um, so th for us, this whole um, interaction, entertainment, given the ultra long range missions that we fly our aircraft is critical to what we do. And I like to think, and I'm sure Panasonic will tell you, that of all the carriers that they've dealt with, Emirates has been the most forceful, the most innovative, and the most creative in trying to do just that. And others have benefited from it, and others have followed. Some have gone past us. Well, good luck to them. At least the bar ke keeps on being raised. And I as long as I'm running this business, will we'll recognize that every product has a cycle. If you leave that cycle unattended to, and don't refresh it, change it, whatever, then you're going to have a problem. Others will do it for you, and then you'll be out of business. So it's something that we are particularly uh, focused on. You mentioned the internet there. Is, is, has everyone got any plans to sort of exploit social media? Uh, uh, we do. I don't like the word exploit. We are engaged. Engaged. We are in the space. Um, it was very clear to us from very early days of social networks um, that the, and this was not driven by so much internet, uh, but by Twitter, Facebook, etc. It was more about when there were incidents in the business, could be a crash, or some kind of incident, the speed at which the new media people were able to use and transmit well before the media organisation, BBC World, CNN, could get to the site. And that was a shocking, this was back 10 years now. And that, so we had to, to um, recognize that this was the future, I think we did. Uh, then of course that, that went off at light speed and enter the social network sites and how transformational they have been with regard to lifestyles and, and for everybody on the planet. So you can be a man in Gaborón and a man in Chengdu or John King can be talking, reading, tweeting, doing all those kind of things. So it's transformational. You need to engage to make sure, in the nicest possible way, that you're not being taken down. The social networks have taken down governments. They will take down brands. Be careful, because it's so interconnected. A lot of people, and I notice it in Europe, so the fortress Europe, guys, it's all changed now. This is a borderless environment. 
the Chinaman, the Spaniard, the South American, the Brazilian, they're all on the same message. They're yeah. all on the same aspiration. They look and dress the same. They have to say, might speak a different language, but aspirationally they want to do the same thing. And they will communicate one way or the other. That mode of communication never existed before. So now we have it, and we as a global player, anybody who is in the global business wants their brand to be accepted and recognized and chosen, needs to ensure that what has been said about them, that they understand, react to, not overcook it, but just have the radar out there to make sure that you know what's going on. So a lot of us and others in other industries are in the space, not trying to manipulate it, but listen, respond, if there are things not quite right or there's disinformation going on, but importantly, it's a very good measure what people in the street do and how they value us because after all that's what we need we need yeah. people to tell us whether we're doing the right thing or the wrong thing okay uh, on, on the environment the, the eu is back back down with regards to extending ets to a, aviation um what is what is emirates preferred way forward with this now i i've always suffered with the ETS schemes. Um, it's, it's a laudable thing to do, obviously, to try and lay off um, uh, pollution, the environmental footprints that we all create. Um, I don't like the draconian nature of what it was, uh, the way it was being imposed upon us. I bitterly oppose the um, collection mechanisms which saw money going into collector nations and that money being used for general treasury purposes rather than being funneled back into R&D or environmental side of things. Um, my own view is how do we go about this? It's a great story that we don't tell. I mentioned earlier propulsion, I mentioned aerodynamics, I mentioned materials and production of aircraft, the flying of those aircraft. Well, these are not the Concords and VC-10s of 30 years ago. These are highly sophisticated, cheap, well-designed, uh, fuel-efficient aeroplanes that do a much better job, carry a lot more people far more cheaply in terms of the environmental footprint than ever happened before. But that seems to be lost. The script is lost. It doesn't get communicated. And so we get that rump of people in the EU, bless them, um, who are, are, are fairly um, zealot-like in their... That means that it, I'm not saying they don't listen, but perhaps in other areas they, there is evidence that people haven't listened or misbehaved or whatever and therefore they've said it's one for all and all for one. So we've been tarred with the same brush and yet it's only 2% and it's something that is vital to the way the global economy moves, aviation, and you must recognise the amount of work that has been done, is being done and will be done in the future. It's one of the great success stories. Automotive is another fantastic story and yet you know, it's uh, and of course, in the last five years, the global economy has slowed down to GDP levels that were back in the sort of seventies and eighties. You know, two or three percent, sixteen percent was in China. Okay, that's at eight now, but others have gone negative. So that of course caused, and they have by accident or design got what they wanted because consumption, pollution has fallen. So going forward. Yes, I'm a great believer in the rape and pillage of our natural resources in the planet and what we're doing for our successive generations that come after us and how we have a responsibility to ensure that we do not squander and waste. And so we as, a, as an industry need to be, sh be, in my view, aware of that and deal with it. You, you know, uh, you know Emirates is now a global brand, it's got global reach. Uh, when you first joined Emirates in, in airline planning in 1985, did, did you ever think that sort of uh, 28 years later you'd, you'd be in charge of this massive aviation No, I didn't. Powerhouse? I didn't, but I was a, a part of a, a group of people who were best described as optimistic, opportunist geeks <laughs> in the business. We loved what we were going to do, and importantly, when the government of Dubai said to us, look, here are the rules of the game, no money, no subsidies, no free oil, no government guarantees of debt creation, none of this, etc. When we looked at that, we thought, whoa, this is... Because I was in Gulf Air and others had come from others. said, well, of course, the airline industry was a basket case then. And they thought, well, how are we going to do this? But that was the challenge. And when they said, anything other than those, you can do what you like. So we thought, well, how do we do this? And what do we do? And because it, it was like a, a great weight coming off our our shoulders when we realised that we were being given a free hand, not many people have done before because you've had government involvement, you've had, you know, requirements of the state to fly these routes, to buy those aeroplanes because they're produced in Germany or the United Kingdom, etc. All that was over. Do what you like, 
don't break the rules and don't ever lose money and don't ever come to us for money. Very sobering thought that, you know, otherwise you won't be here much longer. So, well, anyway, there was a group of us and we had a great time. Morris was the, um, was the kind of leader then, Morris Flanagan. Um, Sheikh Appert was, uh, was working closely with him, learning the business, and there were about 10 of us. And we just got on with the job. We had an absolute ball. And we've had a ball ever since. <laughs> no, where we are today, it didn't happen. But what happened was that little business model we drew up in 1986, I've still got it sepiaed in my bottom drawer. It hasn't changed. It's exactly the same. Nothing's changed. Um, you mentioned uh, Sir Morris Flanagan, obviously. Um, uh, he retired last month. Um, what do you think his overriding legacy is for, for Emirates? Uh, will, will the character of the airline, uh, airline change go forward, do you think? No, I, I don't think so. Um, Morris, of course, got the keys to the, the business, plus the check, <laughs> and it was Charles' the responsibility of, of taking it um, on. Um, I think at the time it was quite difficult because there were many players in the town of Dubai who thought they could do the job. but. Of course, Morris, with his um, his experience in BOAC, British Airways, etc., the the ruler decided that he wasn't the ruler then, but he is now. Was that he was in safer hands because he was already ready, running Dinata, the um, the government's travel organisation, both at the airport and the, so it was that was the right place to put it, and that was the right decision. I think Morris did the right thing with regard to assembling a group of guys who he felt could take it on because he couldn't do it on his own. Of course, it had to be. Um, done with people who could had the energy and the drive to do it. So that was uh, that will go down as he got the right people. He did the right thing at the right time. Um, he was not risk averse, um, nor was Sheikh Ahmed. And Sheikh Mohammed, the ruler of Dubai now, is the most less risk averse person I've ever met. Um, and he's he will take on anything. And it was this kind of mantra of entrepreneurship, um, bravery, boldness, um, fleet of foot, all the things that we were able to, you know, having thrown off the shackles, the constraints of being in the business before and be able to say, well, let's just give this a go. We just went for it and we, the more we did, the better it got. The bigger we got, the better it got. And the unique thing about Emirates organization, now we do not, we've never had a board. We do not have rightly or wrongly, any corporate governance issues. When we decide we're going to do something, we do it and we get on with it. And in, in Morris's era, and obviously Sheikh Ahmed has been constant throughout all of that, a working active Sheikh, very interested in the business. He's now got a plethora of other roles to do, which makes life increasingly difficult for him. But we all have this love of the business. People like me, that is my life. It's my hobby. I don't really want to do anything else. Others, uh, there have been others I've worked with who, who just think and live and breathe aviation. So thank goodness, at the time, we were able to cluster that group of people who compromised just about everything else in their lives to get the job done, unique. Um, and so where was this? Morris was coming through, taking us on, and, um, and, and uh, uh, that continuum of management has always been something that has attracted the attention of the stakeholders that surround us, whether it be the banking community, the aerospace manufacturers or whatever. There's always been <laughs> that group of people, oh, we're getting on a bit, he's gone now. Um, others like me are still there, just. Others with me have already gone and retired, so there aren't many of us left of the old school. But with me working at the moment with my team of people, I have continuity. So if I go for whatever reason, health or whatever, I'm fairly certain that what is behind us in terms of the succession planning and the exposure to the uniqueness of the way we do business are there, will be there to take us on.